Hi everyone and welcome to chapter six. In this chapter we'll be talking about energy, metabolism, and enzymes. So most of the energy that keeps all organisms alive really starts with the sun or comes from the sun. As we can see, producers like plants can capture the energy from the sun through a process called photosynthesis, and we'll talk about that more later on. But some of that energy is lost in the form of heat. Producers can capture sunlight or the energy found in sunlight and use it to produce organic molecules like glucose, which consumers will use. Once the plants and animals die or the producers and consumers die, they are broken down or their molecules, their organic molecules are broken down by decomposers, which can harvest some of the energy found in those chemical bonds. But again, some of that energy is lost in the form of heat. Bioenergetics is the study of energy flow through a living system. And this can be an individual organism or it can be many organisms living together within a larger system. So why do we need energy? We need energy to go through our daily activities, which really refers to metabolism within the cell or organism. And metabolism refers to all of the chemical reactions that are happening within the cell or the living organism. Metabolism includes all of the building reactions and building is also known as anabolic reactions or anabolism and all of the reactions that are breaking down larger molecules into smaller molecules and those are called catabolic reactions or sometimes called catabolism. So a metabolic pathway is a bunch of biochemical reactions that are happening to convert one or more substrates into some kind of final product. And again, these can be building reactions such as through photosynthesis. And an example of an anabolic reaction or a series of anabolic reactions could be taking carbon dioxide and water, these are smaller molecules, and building a larger molecule such as glucose. But these reactions can also be catabolic. For example, down here, we're going to see this reaction in the next chapter. This is the process of cellular respiration, which is overall catabolic, because we're going to take glucose, the larger molecule, and break it down into smaller subunits, including carbon dioxide and water. So again, metabolism is really the sum of the building reactions, the anabolic reactions, and the breakdown, or catabolic reactions. When I look at anabolic reactions, these always require energy input, and you're building larger molecules from smaller ones. And I can see that up here. So I can see in anabolic reactions, I'm taking smaller subunits with an input of energy and I'm building a larger molecule. And in my catabolic reaction, I can see that I'm taking a larger molecule and breaking it down into smaller subunits and energy is released in this case. Interestingly, all types of living organisms share some common metabolic pathways. And this tells us or provides evidence that all of us originated from a common ancestor. But over time, there are differences in these metabolic pathways that develop due to the development of specialized enzymes that allow these organisms to be specialized or adapt to their specific environments. Interestingly, though, all organisms in these metabolic pathways ultimately will harvest energy from their environment, for example, from eating, eating or consuming other organisms and breaking down chemical bonds to make some kind of ATP, some kind of form of energy, so that we can use the energy stored in this molecule to carry out other functions inside the cell. So here I have two types of chemical reactions, and I wonder if I show you this picture, can you guys tell me which one is anabolic and which one is catabolic? Let's take a closer look. So at the top, I see I've got two smaller molecules, and I'm linking them together to form a larger one. I'm building. So building is anabolic. I think of sometimes anabolic steroids because I hear that a lot in the news. I'm building. And whenever I'm building larger molecules, I'm going to have to put energy into the reaction. So usually this is in the form of ATP. And the bottom one, I'm taking a larger molecule, breaking it down into two smaller 
subunit, so that must be breaking down, and that would be a catabolic reaction. And I know energy would be released. Energy would be released, and usually I can capture that in the form of ATP. What about the process of photosynthesis? Using light energy to synthesize. So synthesize, I'm building something. What do you guys think? Would that be anabolic or catabolic? I think the word synthesis kind of gives it away, that it's going to be a building or anabolic reaction overall. And if I look at the overall equation for photosynthesis, it kind of supports my answer. I'm taking several carbon dioxide molecules, several water molecules, the energy from the sun, and I'm going to be building a larger glucose molecule and release some oxygen as well. So overall, this will be an anabolic reaction, and we're going to see this in chapter eight. So what are the types of energies we have available to do work? I know energy is the ability to do work, and there are two types. We have kinetic energy, which happens when something is in motion or moving, or we have potential energy when objects have a potential to move. And in our book, it gives us a link to a website that shows us something like a pendulum, almost like a grandfather's clock. And when the pendulum is swinging, when it goes up, during the motion, there's kinetic energy, but then it pauses up here. And now there's no kinetic energy, but high potential energy because it has the ability or potential to move back down. So what are examples of potential and kinetic energy inside cells? One example comes from chapter five when we were talking about diffusion. Remember diffusion is when molecules can move from a high concentration to the side where they have a lower concentration. And here I see this, when there is a high concentration of a molecule on one side, there's high potential energy for the molecules to move. When they're actually moving, I can see kinetic energy. Energy is released until the concentration of the molecule across both sides of the membrane is equal. Then there is just random movement across the membrane. In the bottom example, we have chemical energy. Chemical energy is stored in chemical bonds. And a good example is at the bottom right. I have this disaccharide that has energy stored within the chemical bonds. That's a form of potential energy. If I break the bonds, that is energy that is released, so that is kinetic energy. And we usually capture that energy if we're not using it right away and store it in the form of ATP so that we can use it for something else. We can use this energy to power some kind of other reaction in the future. Our book also gives us the example of potential energy stored in the chemical bonds of gasoline. And we can transform that into the kinetic energy that allows the car to race on a racetrack. So it looks like this is, is that octane? It looks like eight of them. So we have octane and we know that as we break the chemical bonds, energy is released to power the movement of that car. In biology, whenever we're talking about energy in terms of how much energy do we need to build a larger molecule or how much energy is released when we break a larger molecule down into smaller subunits, we're almost always talking about Gibbs free energy. This is the amount of energy that's available to do work, also known as, aka, usable energy. And this is after we account for the energy that was lost as heat. We can calculate Gibbs free energy down here using this equation, where change in G, delta G, which is Gibbs free energy, the final Gibbs free energy minus the initial Gibbs free energy of the reaction, is equal to the total energy or enthalpy of the system minus the energy that was lost as heat or entropy that was lost to disorder. So delta G, my Gibbs free energy, is again equal to the change in the total energy of the system, enthalpy, minus temperature in Kelvin times change in entropy, which is disorder. So let's apply the Gibbs free energy equation to our chemical reactions in biology. If energy is released in some kind of chemical reaction, we call this an exergonic reaction, and delta G will be less than zero. It'll be a negative number. So how does this work? 
Let's look at the graph below. All right, I see Gibbs free energy. My starting point is here, so that's my initial Gibbs free energy. And my final energy value looks like it's down here, so this is my final Gibbs free energy value. And I'm just going to put random numbers here. Let's pre pretend this is like 10, and up here this is 100 at this point right here. So I can tell that GF minus G initial, that's, what is that, 10 minus 100. And usually we have units of joules per mole or kilojoules per mole. But I'm going to ignore the units right now. I have minus 90. That's negative. Whenever you have a negative delta G, this is an exergonic reaction because energy is released. Energy has been released. And I can see that here as well. I have a high energy value for my reactants. Some kind of reaction occurs over time. And then energy has been released right here. And here I have low energy at the end of the reaction. Extragonic reactions are called spontaneous reactions because they will happen even if you do not put in any energy. But one of the biggest mistakes that students make is they think spontaneous means fast, and it does not, does not mean fast. Sometimes these reactions take millions of years. So as long as you don't have to put in energy and it still happens, whether it takes a thousand years or a million years, we still call it spontaneous. So again, spontaneous is not, does not necessarily mean fast. And then something, I see a little hump right here. We're gonna talk about that in a, in a bit. That little hump is something called activation energy. On this slide, I see what looks like the mirror image of the previous slide. If a chemical reaction requires an input of energy, if you have to put in energy to get the reaction to happen, then delta G will be a positive value, and these are called endergonic reactions. So we're putting in some energy to get it to happen. And if I use the same numbers I used earlier, let's say this is the initial Gibbs free energy, and I'm going to use the same number, 10. And this is the final Gibbs free energy, and I used 100 earlier. So let's see, G final minus G initial, that's delta G. So final is 100, I can see that's the products, minus initial is 10 down here. That would be a positive value. So I can see that is an endergonic reaction. I have more energy at the end of the reaction than when I started. And again, delta G is greater than zero. And again, I see something over here that activation energy we'll talk about in a bit. But I know that I had to put in energy to get this to happen. And that makes a lot of sense if I pretend I have a ball here and I'm rolling it up the hill. I need to put in energy to get the ball to go all the way down to the product side. Okay, and this has nothing to do with biology at all, but this graph always reminds me of those bowling games that you see at carnivals. Have you guys ever played this game? You have to like push the bowling ball just enough so that it goes here and it stays in the hump and it doesn't come back. Anyways, this always reminds me of that bowling game. I've never won before. You guys can tell me how to win if you know the secret. So here's that same picture when I was talking about anabolism and catabolism. Let's see, which chemical reaction would be exergonic and release energy or have, what did we say, delta G would be greater or less than zero? Exergonic reactions are going to kind of look like this. So I know G final will be lower than G initial. So that would be less than zero. So an exergonic reaction is whenever we take a larger molecule, chop it up, and break it into smaller pieces, because that will release energy. Energy will come out of the reaction. So that would be the bottom one. That would be an exergonic reaction. Delta G would be negative. OK, so that takes us to the end of our first video for chapter 6. In our next video, we're going to be talking about activation energy that little bump we had to get through or get past before we could get to the product side of the reaction.